This elfin mount. Which would explain why it's lizards. So. Several large lizards were running nimbly in and out among the cliffs of an old tree. They could understand each other perfectly well, for they spoke all the lizards, all the lizards' language. Only hear what a rumbling and grumbling there is in the old elfin mount yonder, observed one lizard. I have not been able to close my eyes for the past two nights. I might as well have had a toothache for the sleep I have had. There is something in the wind, most certainly, rejoined the second lizard. They raise the mount upon four red pillars till cock crowing. There is a regular cleaning and dusting going on, and the elven maidens are learning new dances. Such a stamping they make in them. There is certainly something in the wind on the wind. Yes, I have been talking it over with the earthworm of my acquaintance, said the third lizard. The earthworm has just come from the mount. He has been grubbing in the ground for days and nights together, and has heard, overheard a good deal. He can't see it all, poor wretch, but no one can be quicker than he is at feeling and hearing. They are expecting strangers at the elfin mount distinguished strangers. But who they are, the earthworm could not say. Most likely, he did not know. All the will-o'-the-wisps are engaged to form a procession of torches, so they call it, and all the silver and gold, of which there is such store in the elven mount, is being fresh rubbed up and set out to shine in the moonlight. But who can these strangers be? exclaimed all the lizards with one voice. What can be in the wind? Only listen. What buzzing and humming. Just then, the elven mount parted asunder, and an elderly elven damsel came tripping out. She was the old elven king's housekeeper, and distantly related to his family, on which account she wore an amber heart on her forehead, but was otherwise plainly dressed. Like all other elves, she was hollow in the back. She was qu quick and footed. Trip, trip, trip. She ran away straight into the marsh to the night raven. You are invited to Elven Mount for this very evening, she said. But will you not first do us a very great kindness and be the bearer of the other invitations? Do you not keep house yourself, you know? You so easily oblige us. We are expecting some very distinguished strangers. Trolls, in fact. And his elven majesty intends to welcome them in person. Who are to be invited? inquired the night raven. Why, to the grand ball all the world may come. Even men. If they could but talk in their sleep. Or do a little but anything in our way. But the first banquet must be very select. None but the guests of the very highest rank must be present. And to say the truth, I and the king have been having a little dispute, for I insist that not even ghosts may be admitted tonight. The Murking and his daughters must be invited first. They don't much like coming on land, but I'll promise they shall have a wet stone or perhaps something better still to sit on. And then, I think, they cannot possibly refuse us this time. To the trolls, the river bank, we must have. Also, the river spirit and his nieces. And, um, I fancy we cannot pass over the death horse and the king groom. True, they do not belong to our set. They are too solemn for us. But they are connected with the family and pay regular visits. Ka said the night raven, and away he flew to bear the invitations. The elven maidens were still dancing in the elven mount. They danced with long scarves woven from mist and moonlight, and for those who like that sort of thing, it looks pretty enough. The large stateroom in the mount had been regularly cleaned and cleared out. The floor had been washed with moonshine, 
and the wall was rubbed with witch's fat till they shone as tulips do when they open up in the light. In the kitchen, frogs were roasting on the spit, while divers, uh, other choice dishes, such as mushroom seed, hemlock soup, etc., were being prepared and prepper, prepared and preparing. Mm. These were to supply the first courses. Rusty nails, bits of colored glass, and such like dainties were to come in for the dessert. There was also a bright saltpeter wine, and ale brewed in the brewery of the wise witch of the moor. Tasty. The old Elven King's gold crown had been fresh rubbed and powdered with slate pencil. New curtains had been hung up in all the sleeping rooms. Yes, there was indeed a rare bustle and commotion. Now we must have the room scented with cow's hairs and swine's bristles, and then I think I shall have done my part, said the Elven King's housekeeper. Poor Papa, said the youngest of the daughters. Won't you tell me now who these grand visitors are? Well, replied his majesty, I suppose there's no use in keeping it a secret. Let two of my daughters get themselves ready for their wedding day. That's all. Two of them most certainly will be married. The chief of the Norwegian trolls, who dwells in the old Dorafeld, and has so many castles of free stone among these rocky fastnesses, besides a gold mine, which is a capital thing, let me tell you. He is coming down here with his two boys, who are both to choose themselves a bride. Such an honest, straightforward, true old Norseman and his mountain chief. So merry and jovial. He and I are old comrades, and we came down here years ago to fetch his wife. She's dead now. She was the daughter of the Rock King at Moen. Oh, how I long to see the old Norseman again. His sons, they say, are rough, mannerly cubs, but perhaps report may have done them some injustice. And at any rate, they're sure to improve in a year or two, when they have you know, sown their wild oats. Let me see how you will polish them up. Uh -huh. And how soon are they to be here? inquired the youngest daughter again. That depends on wind and weather, returned the Elven King. They travel economically. They come at the ship's convenience. I wanted them to pass over by Sweden, but the old man would not hear of that. He does not keep pace with the times. That's the only fault I can find in him. Just then, two will-o'-the-wisps were seen dancing up in a vast hurry, each trying to get before the other, and to be the first to bring the news. They come! They come! Both cried in one voice. Bring me my crown, and let me stand in the moonlight, said the Elven King. And his seven daughters lifted their long scarves and bowed low to the earth. There stood the trolled chief from Dorfelfeld, wearing a crown composed of icicles and polished pine cones. For the rest, he was equipped in a bearskin cloak and sledge boots. His sons were clad more slightly and kept their throats uncovered, by way of showing that they cared nothing about the cold. Is that the mount? asked the youngest of them, pointing it out. Why, up in the north, we should have called it a cave. You foolish boy, replied his father. A cave you go into, a mount you go up to. Where are your eyes, not to see the difference? The only thing that surprised them in this country, they said, was that the people should speak and understand their language. Behave yourselves now, said the old man. Don't let your host fancy you were never went to decent company before. And now they all entered the Elfin Mount, into the Grand Salon, where a really very select party was assembled. 
Although, at such short notice that it seemed almost as though some fortunate gust of wind might have blown them together. And every possible arrangement had been made for the comfort of each of the guests. The Murkings family, for instance, sat at a table in a large tubs of water, where they declared they felt quite as if they were at home. They behaved with strict good breeding, except the two northern trolls, who at last so far forgot themselves as to put their legs on the table. Such manners. Take your legs away from the plates, said their father, and they obeyed, but not so readily that they might have done. Presently they took some pine cones out of their pockets and began pelting the lady who sat between them. And then, finding that their boots incommode them, they took them off and coolly gave them to the lady to hold. But their father, the old mountain chief, conducted himself very differently. He talked so delightfully about the proud Norse mountains, and the torrents, white with dancing spray, that dashed foaming down their rocky steep, with a noise loud and hoarse as thunder, yet musical as a full burst of an organ, touched by a master hand. He told of the salmon leaping up from the wild waters while the neck was playing on his golden harp. He told of the starlight winter nights when the sledge bells tinkled so merrily, and the youths ran with lighted torches over the icy crust, so glassy and transparent that though it were to see the fishes whirling to and fro in the deadly terror beneath their feet, he told of the gallant northern youths and pretty maidens singing songs of old time, and dancing the halogen's dance, yes, so charmingly he described this all, you could not but fancy you heard it and saw it all. Oh, fie, for shame! All of a sudden the mountain chief turned upon the elderly elven maiden and gave her a cousinly salute, and he was not yet connected ever so remotely with the family. The young elven maidens were now called upon to dance. First they danced simple steps, then stamping dances. And then they did both remarkably well. Last came the most difficult of all, the dance out of the dance, as it was called. Bravo! How long their legs seemed to grow, and how they whirled and spun about. You could hardly distinguish legs from arms or arms from legs. Round and round they went, such whirling and twirling, such whirring and whizzing that they had made the death horse feel quite dizzy. And at last he grew so unwell that he was obliged to leave the table. Hurrah! cried the mountain chief. They know how to use their limbs with a vengeance. But can they do nothing else than dance? Stretch out their feet and spin around like a whirlwind? <laughs> oh, shall judge yourself replied the elven king, and here he called the oldest of the daughters to him. She was transparent and fair as moonlight. She was, in fact, the most delicate of all the sisters. She put a white wand between her lips and vanished. That was her accomplishment. But the mountain chief said he could not at all like his wife to possess such an accomplishment as this, and he did not think his sons would like it either. Who would want their wife to just disappear at random? The second could walk by the side of herself, just as though she had a shadow, which elves and trolls never have. The accomplishment of the third sister was quite another kind. She had learned how to brew good ale from the wise witch of the moor, and she also knew how to hard alder woods and worm with little worms. <laughs> she will make a capital housewife, remarked the old man, mountain chief. And now advanced the fourth elven damsel. She carried a large gold harp, and no sooner had she struck the first chord than all the company lifted to their feet 
for elves are left-sided. And when she struck the second chord, they were all compelled to do whatever she wished. <clears throat> A dangerous lady indeed, said the old troll chief. Both of the sons now got up and strode out to the mount. And they were hardly weary of these accomplishments. And what can the next daughter do? asked the mountain chief. I have learned to love the north, replied she, and I have resolved never to marry unless I may go to Norway. But the youngest of the sisters whispered to the old man, That is only because she heard an old Norse rhyme which says that when the end of the world shall come, the Norwegian rocks shall stand firm amid the ruins. She is very much afraid of death, and therefore she wants to go to Norway. <clears throat> uh, nice to see you come in, Altered. That uh, was... Ho, oh, oh, ho, cried the mountain chief. Sits the wind in that quarter. <laughs> and what can the seventh and last do? <clears throat> the sixth come before the seventh, said the elfin king, for he could count better than to make such a mistake. However, the sixth seems in no hurry to come forward. I can only tell people the truth, she said. But let no one trouble himself about me. I have enough to do to sew my shroud. And now came the seventh and last. And what could she do? Why, she could tell fairy tales. As many as one could wish for. <coughs> Here are my five fingers, said the mountain chief. Tell me a story for each finger. And the elven maid took hold of his wrist and told her stories. He laughed till his sides ached, and when she came to the finger that wore a gold ring, as though she knew it might be wanted, the mountain king suddenly exclaimed, Hold fast what thou hast. The hand is mine. I shall have thee myself to wife. But the elven maiden said that she still had two more stories to tell, one for the ring finger and one for the little finger. Keep them for what next winter, we'll hear them then, replied the mountain chief. And we'll hear about the lovers of the fir tree and the birch. About the Valkyria's gifts, too, for we all love fairy legends in Norway. And no one there can tell them so charmingly as thou dost. And then we will sit in our rocky hills, whilst the fir logs are blazing and crackling in the stove, and drink mead out of golden horns of the Norse kings. The neck has taught me a few of his rare ditties. Besides, the garbo will come often and pay us a visit, and he will sing thee all the sweet songs the mountain maiden sang in the days of yore. That will be most delightful. The salmon on the torrent will spring up and beat himself against the rock walls, but in vain he will not be able to get in. Oh, thou canst imagine what a happy, glorious life we will lead in my dear old Norway. But where are the boys? <coughs> <laughs> where were the boys? Why, they were racing about in the fields, blowing out all the poor will-o'-the-wisps, who were just ranging themselves in a proper order to make a procession of torches. What do you mean by making all this riot? Required, inquired the mountain chief. I have been choosing you a mother. Now you come and choose yourselves wives from among your aunts. <laughs> oh, yeah. But his sons said they would rather make speeches and drink toasts. They had not the slightest wish to marry. Accordingly, they made speeches and tossed off their glasses and turned them topsy-turvy on the table to show that they were quite empty. 
After this, they took off their coats and most unceremoniously lay down on the table and went to sleep. But the old mountain chief, the while, danced around the hall with his young bride and exchanged boots with her, because it is not so vulgar as exchanging rings. Listen, the cock is crowing, exclaimed the lady housekeeper. We must haste and shut the window shutters closed, or the sun will scorch our complexions. <clears throat> and here with Elven Mount closed. But outside the cloven trunk, the lizards kept running up and down, and one and all declared, What a capital fellow that old Norwegian troll is! For my part, I prefer the boy, said the earthworm. But he, poor wretch, could see nothing, either of them or their father, so his opinion was not worth much. <laughs>